Beloveds, let's turn in our Bible to the Gospel of Luke. We're in chapter 22. We're going to be reading from verse 54 to the end of the chapter, verse 71. I'll read it to you, reading from the NIV. Um, yeah. Then, seizing him, that is Jesus, they, that is the crowd, led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance, but when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down with them. And a servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. And she looked closely at him and said, This man was with him, but he, that is Peter, denied it. Woman, I, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him, that is Peter, and said, You're also one of them. I am, man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with them, for he is a Galilean. And Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the cock crowed. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered the word that the Lord had spoken to him. Before the cock crows today, you will have disowned me three times. Then he went outside and wept bitterly. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, Prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together. And Jesus was led before them. If you are the Christ, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. And they all asked, are you then the Son of God? And he replied, you are right in saying I am. And then they said, what need or, what, or why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. And the whole assembly arose and led him off to Pilate. Oh, sorry. I right, right, carried on. I'm reading the rest of it. I got carried away. Excuse me. That's the story. Once you start, oh man, it's hard to stop. Beautiful. <clears throat> so we're still in where we were still in the garden. We were, we were at that point when Jesus had surrendered himself over to the, the power and the authority of the, the crowd. Indeed, in verse 53, he says that this is darkness's hour. This is the moment that has been waiting for. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy that was given in Eden's garden. When God said to Adam and Eve that, or and to the serpent, that the, the, the serpent should strike and bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. This is that moment where all hell shall be unleashed upon our Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us very, first of all, then seizing him, they led him away to took, and took him to the house of the high priest. Now, according to Jewish law, it was illegal to seize anyone without first reading them their rights or indeed reading them the charge that had been brought against them if you were to arrest someone you had to have a legitimate reason why to arrest them it's not too much unlike today you just couldn't go up and seize somebody if you were a, a, a jewish citizen you had certain rights especially when you were in israel and the, the right of every citizen was the ability to be able to defend themselves in a court of law and to be able to know why they were being arrested. It was also very interesting, I read today, that it was illegal to arrest someone at night. You had to do it during the day. I thought that was very convenient. 
You know, if you want to be a skip, just run away in the middle of the night. But no, it was everything had to be done during the daylight hours, during the time when when up, everything was up front. And here this crowd sees Jesus. Now the word is spoken with, with not with violence in the sense it was mob craziness and wildness, but it's with a like a, a, a decided grip. They took him. There was no thinking about it. They, they took him and it's with speed, with haste. And they take him to the house of the high, high priest. Now every gospel that we have all four of them contain this story. All four Gospels have different aspects of it. They all look differently at it. Luke's Gospel gives us a little bit more, a, a different angle on the rest. But when you add them all together, you get a fuller picture. It's very interesting to know that all four Gospels contain this story about Peter disowning Jesus. By Peter betraying Jesus. It shows that the writers of the New Testament in its original form had nothing to hide. If you were going to set yourself up as the leader of a new religious movement, you wouldn't want to be the one associated with denying or, or betraying or, or distancing yourself from your main worshipful figure. And yet we see the honesty and the integrity of this, of, of, of this record that Peter's folly, Peter's betrayal, disowning Jesus, denying Christ is recorded. It's a great lesson for us that everything is seen. Everything will be laid bare. There's nothing that is hidden that will not be seen. We live our lives before the very eyes of God. And nothing we do, whether it's private or public, will ever be hidden. One day everything will be seen. Everything, every, every folly that we've ever committed, every denial, every betrayal, every distancing ourselves from Jesus shall be seen. We cannot hide Cannot pretend and live in denial. Be an Egyptian, as my boy says, live in denial. Denial. Being an Egyptian. We must all remember that every aspect of our life will be brought forward. One day, the Bible says, when we stand before God, um, all the books shall be opened. The record of our life set down. And set before all humanity. And all humanity will be able to see the record of our life. Every thought. Every feeling. Every word. Every action. Laid bare before all of humanity. Worst still. Before the great white throne. Before God himself. It's sobering isn't it? To know that. Our lives are, are, are so apparent, so public, even the, our private life. Again, I, I don't know if I would have wanted my great failing to be written down for eternity. When we meet Peter in heaven, we'll be able to say, gosh, you were the guy in the garden, weren't you? Oh, a bit of a slip up there. All four have this. Tells us here that they took him to the house of the high priest. Which is very interesting for at that time in, in Israel they actually had two high priests. It tells us in the book of John that they took him to the house of Aeneas. Aeneas was the original high priest. But because Aeneas fell out of favor with the Romans. The, the political power. The occupying power. They felt that Aeneas was too powerful. He had a monopoly on the temple worship. And when you think of Aeneas, think of Don Coliovi, whatever his name is, no, from the Godfather. Think of a Godfather type figure. Think of a Jewish mafia. He was the high priest, but he was really a racketeer. He was running a racketeer system. 
They were a mafia. And so the Romans deposed him. They felt that he was too powerful. And so they took him out of position and replaced him with another man called Caiaphas. The interesting thing about Caiaphas is Caiaphas is the son-in-law to Aeneas. They kept it in the family. And so what we really see happening in the time of Christ was publicly the high priest was Caiaphas. He was the public face. He was the, the, the liaison between Rome and Israel. But the man who really ruled, the man who really had his finger on the pulse, who really said what was going to happen, was an ass. And we know this because why? Because it tells us in the book of John that when, when they seized Jesus, when they imprisoned him or captured him, arrested him, he wasn't really arrested. Remember, he never had his rights read to him. The charge was never given against them. They just seized them, unlawfully so, and took him not to a place of confinement, not to a jail or a police station, or to the army garrison where they were legally supposed to take him. They were required to take him to one of these places. But instead, they take him to the house of the high priest, to the house of Aeneas. Now, don't think of a house like our houses, you know, like a little box. Think of a, an office building. Think of a, a plaza. You guys have been to Italy, some of you have been to Israel. And you, you understand that in Israel and, and, and Mediterranean buildings, they were built with the back of the house facing forward. I know it's weird. And then you had like a square and in the, in the middle of, you had like a courtyard and around you had like a, um, not a tunnel, but you know like a, a, it's called a port in English, I don't know what it's called. A, a, a sheltered part, you know, underneath the buildings where you could rest during the heat of the day. And you had to pass under the building through a, a, a corridor, like a little tunnel to get into the courtyard. When Jesus is arrested, he's taken to Aeneas' house. Now Aeneas lives on one side of the house and Caiaphas lives on the other side of the house. And in between their houses are the official, bu the official buildings, you know, like the tax building and the other administration building. So you have one house, the other house, an ass house. They take Jesus there and the Bible tells us that he's on some sort of balcony or some sort of uh, raised courtyard that overlooks the courtyard where everyone is. Now the Bible tells us again that Peter followed at a distance. Tells us in the, in the Gospel of John that Peter and another disciple, whom the high who's known to the high priest, follow on. When they get to the courtyard, it's still in the middle of the night. Jesus was arrested around maybe two, three, two o'clock, one o'clock in the morning. Arrested. And he's taken to the courtyard. And right now, the story shifts. It's really unusual in the Gospels. The story shifts away from Jesus for a moment and gives us insight into the life of Peter, into the, the life of, of one of the disciples. No longer is the story about Jesus. The, this is the gospel of the, the Lord Jesus Christ. The story of Jesus. But now in this little inleg, it changes. It's now a story about one of his disciples. Peter is following at a distance. Whatever that distance is, we don't know, but not close. It tells us in the Gospel of John, when he got to the house of the high priest, he wasn't allowed in. But the disciple who was known to the high priest, we believe it was John, but we don't know. He spoke to the little girl who was the gatekeeper of the, of the, the house, and she let Peter in. Now please imagine, it's not like today, where we have electric lights. When we go into a dark place, we switch the light on, and all of a sudden it's daylight again. Darkness is 
no longer really exists in, in the modern Western world. But in the Middle East, dark is dark. When Sarah and I were in Africa many years ago, 2007, I think, or whatever, I think, when the sun went down in Uganda, it was dark. It was dark. You couldn't see anything. Uh, we couldn't go outside because of fear of snakes and walking into people and stuff. It was just so black. And then again, when I was in Afghanistan and Tajikistan with some of the guys, in 2007 or 6, when we were up in the mountains, when the sun went down, it was dark. And even still today, it's November time here in Finland and you go into the forest and it is dark. You can't see anything. And so it was in this courtyard. Remember they had lanterns and they had lamps, but in the courtyard it was dark. And you had a little bit of anonymity. You could be hidden. You could hide your identity from people in the shadows. But it was bitterly cold. The Bible tells us it was bitterly cold. and The crowd, the multitude that had gathered, all of the servants, the slaves, the, the police officers who were there, who had arrested Jesus, who had been a part of the, the events of the garden, they were all gathered in the courtyard. And they lit a fire together and they're keeping warm. And I don't think of some little fire. Think of a brazier. Think of like a big barbecue. It wasn't a small, tiny, triangle type fire. We're talking like a barrel. Something big. And they had it in the middle. And everyone's gathered round. They're all trying to keep warm. People are trying to push forward to get a little bit of heat. And there's some... Also, Peter at this time will be going through, coming down from the shock. Have you ever been part of a situation where something shocking has happened. Something has happened, you know, you've, you've seen a, a car accident or someone you know is in your death and then 20 minutes to half an hour later, you're, you're coming down from the shock. You yourself are shivering cold. You know, your, your head's all over the place. You're a little bit numb. Peter would have been suffering from shock by about this time. And so he's trying to get closer to the fire. And the Bible tells us that as he's there and the people around him are discussing the things that happened that night. You can imagine. I mean, remember, they were in the garden and they approached Jesus. And they, Jesus asked them who you're looking for. And he says, they say, Jesus of Nazareth, I am. And they all fall down, stumble back and fall under the power of the Holy Spirit. And they get up and they ask again, who... Uh, who are you looking for? And he asks, and they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And then uh, Peter gets his big sword, little sword, and hits the servant or the slave of the high priest. I think his name was Malthus. Malthus. Cuts his ear off in some sense. Jesus pff, sticks it back on. Shocking. They've all seen Jesus the last week in the temple, they all know who he is. They all know something un unrighteous is happening here. They're all part of the conspiracy. And it, they must have been talking about it constantly around the fire. You know how people are. And if they didn't know something, they were making something up. I heard this. And I, I saw this. And you know what do you think is going to happen? I don't know. Mm, he's going to die. And Peter's there among them. And all of a sudden, some little girl, and I think this is very interesting, the, it's, the idea is little maid, not maid as in a serving girl, but a maiden, teenage girl, a small girl, not yet a woman. She points at Peter and says, he was one of them. He was with them. Because she saw him come in, didn't she? She saw him come in with, with John, who was known to the high priest or the, the disciple. And she identifies Peter. <laughs> Peter, who's trying to be invisible but stay warm around the fire, surrounded by his enemies. And the first thing that comes out of him is a denial. Woman, I, I don't know him. And first and foremost, there's this distancing himself from Jesus. I don't know him. 
don't know what you're talking about. Who is this Jesus? No idea. Yeah, it's just a few hours ago. In the safety of the upper room. While they were having a religious gathering. Peter boastfully proclaimed that he was ready to follow Jesus to both prison and death. It was very easy to make those proclamations. Very easy to make that declaration when surrounded by friends. In the security of the company of Jesus. When there were no strangers or enemies around. It was very easy to proclaim his discipleship. His ready for martyrdom. His preparation for persecution. It's very easy when there's nothing on the line. When there's no cost, it's easy to to proclaim that you'll pay a cost. But here and now, when the rubber was met the road, when the testing came, when the, the trial was upon him, he crumpled immediately. And it wasn't some big man. The devil's the most craftiest being in all the planet. Surely, if, if some big man, you know, we all know that Peter was a big man, proud, boastful, a fisherman, probably very physical. I always get this, they called him Rock, Rocky. He must have been a big man. I imagine if somebody, and I mean, he was a. Surrounded by an army, he was the first one to hack away, you know. Jump in both feet. And yet, when a little girl pointed her finger and identified him as a disciple of Jesus, as one who had been with Jesus, all of his bravado, all of his strength vanished. Again, if some other big man had pointed the finger... There may have been some sort of response, some sort of big, powerful But the attack never comes the way we think it will. The attack came from a point of weakness. Some child, some little girl, some little slave girl of no importance whom we don't know her name. But her pointing of the finger and her accusation was enough to make this big man falter in such a terrible way. I mean, here he is, Peter who has declared his love for Jesus, his belief in Jesus, has left all that he has owned to be with Jesus, has sacrificed and endured, been a part of everything, is part of the inner circle, and all of a sudden, in the blink of an eye, he denounces it all. I don't know who Jesus is. Who, who, can you think of the stupidity of that? Here's everybody. They've just come back from arresting Jesus. They've just come back from, from capturing him. He, he's right there. Everyone can see his head. Surrounded by the, the, the Sanhedrin and Aeneas. They probably hear the shouting and the laughing and the accusations. It's from this mass of people out in the courtyard where they begin to try and take their false witnesses. And here's Peter saying, who? Who are we talking about? Jesus? Who's this Jesus? Never heard of him. Could you imagine the foolishness? I mean, how stupid would you look? How stupid would that, you know, it's like if you have children, I have, I have a few, and... Uh, one of them is playing with something. I have, I have one child in particular who, who likes to touch things. And you're like, if you keep doing that, it's going to break. And then he kind of, you know, wanders away quickly. And then you find it. And you're like, who broke this? Who touched it? I told you not to touch this. Did you, did you, did you, did you break? What from? What? What? And you, you know, you know, you look at him when you broke it, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. Phone? Why am I always blamed? Why am I always the one? And you know it's such an obvious lie. I mean, you can see through it. You don't have to be a grown-up to know. And all his brothers are looking at him going, ah, he did it. There's no, there's no 
solidarity and brothers. <laughs> Finger is pointed immediately. He did it, not me. Peter's lie is so transparent, so foolish. And the Bible tells us that he quickly shuffles off. He, he leaves the, the light. He leaves the heat. And he shuffles off into the darkness to under the Colosseum. Colosse- the, 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 the entrance to the, the courtyard. And he hides in the shadow and he's there. And then the Bible tells us again that a little later, someone else saw him, a man. And he says, you also are one of them. Now he, he's pointing to the disciples. Not only were you with Jesus, but you're one of the disciples. You're one of that Nazarene group. And then Peter says, I am not. Not only did he deny Christ, he denies his association with the the company of Christ, with the people of Jesus. I am not. Not me. I didn't do it. I'm no, 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 no. There is this getting further and further and further away, both physically. Emotionally, he's distancing himself from the cause. And then we're told here, about an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was him. And the word certainly there is, without doubt, without doubt this guy, this man was with him, for he is a Galilean. And that was a big giveaway. Please remember that we're in Jerusalem, in fancy Jerusalem. It's like, you know, Helsinki or Espo, you know. It's better people live there. People of a certain standing who dress a certain way, who speak in a certain kind of way, who've all been to the same universities, Hankin or whatever, you know, my son, yeah. Who all have certain degrees and they all wear the same kind of clothes. Now, in, in Jerusalem, they had a certain style, a certain fashion, a certain way of communicating. They had been to the same schools, you know. And so you you saw it. We don't really appreciate the tribalism of the ancient world. We don't really appreciate that, that people could tell where you were from by the way that you dressed. I mean, we still have some echoes of that. I mean, we have the national dress. Do we have national dress? Ladies have a national dress. And you can tell from one, what district, what part of the world a person comes from, from the way they're dressed. Now, we don't really have that in our world today. I mean, you can't tell that I'm an Irishman just because of the way I'm dressed the way that I am. I don't have my cap on, so you can't tell. If I put my cap on, you'll be like, he's an Irishman. Or if I put my leprechaun hat on, you might know. But if I went to your house, said Christmas time, And there I saw in the window a cross, a heart, and an anchor. And I would be like, oh, are you from the Jakobstad region? You're like, yes, how do you know us? Because you've got the the sign. Or if I went to your house and you had the the star of Nukabe, I'd be like, oh, you've got something to do with Nukabe in your house. So, you you, you, yeah, yeah, how did you know this? Nukabe, Nukabe. And we all kind of know that there are small elements of tribalism that are still existent in our our culture. In the ancient world, it was much more prevalent. People could tell because of the cloth that you were wearing or the style of clothes. We wore our clothes this way, you wear them that way. The, The head ropes that you wore. People could tell, but even more so, their accents the way that you used your language. Galilee was a despised region. It was no better than the pagan world. It was on the border, as it were. And, and they, they just, they thought it was a collaboration of Roman and Greek. And it was despised. The Jews despised. One of the reasons why they hated Jesus was because he, he was from Galilee. Probably spoke with a country accent. I always think... You have to give me liberty here, okay? Imagine if you, in our world context of America, just for that kind of, and if you were to go to Washington, D.C., I've been to Washington, it's 
Real lovely place. Very, everybody wears suits and stuff, okay? And you think, wow. And so Jesus is amongst, Washington is like Jerusalem and everybody's wearing suits and they're all got their really Windsor ties and all the nice stuff, you know, they're all well-dressed. And then all of a sudden these country people come, redneck as you can get. They've got the mullet, shave side. They've got the cut-off T-shirts, you know, with the flag on the front and the eagle on the back. Stereotypes and prejudice, I know, I know. But I actually know people who like this. Okay, they've got the, the jeans, the faded jeans and the big boots. And of course they pull up in their pickup truck with a flag, Trump flag hanging out of it. And you can just see all the people from Washington going, <laughs> oh, that's not the America that I hold. And there's this, this, oh, tenseness between those two cultures. That's what you're seeing here. When they identify him as a Galilean, they're saying redneck, hillbilly, country. They're saying not one of us. And they identify, can you all have a picture now of Peter with a mullet? It's always going to be now for the rest of your life. Peter has a mullet and, uh, and a cut-off t-shirt. They recognized him and there was this, he couldn't, and then again, he, he denies it. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew that he began to use profanity. Not only did he deny it, deny it but he began to curse and to swear to try and hide the fact that he was, to try and use his bigness and his gruffness to, to bully them into leaving him alone. And he called down curses upon himself. May God strike me dead in his profanity. And in the moment that he did that, the rooster crowed, the cockerel crowed. And in that moment, it says here in Luke's gospel that the Lord Jesus turned around wherever he was, whatever was happening to him, and we know what was happening to him at that point was terrible. They were abusing him. They were mocking him. They were taking advantage of him. They were making sport of him, physically abusing him. But in that moment, the cock will crow. Jesus was able to turn around and look at Peter. And I, I like to believe that Peter was making such a commotion, such a noise, such a big, you know, when you want people to believe you, you speak louder. I don't know if you know that. My mom, my mom, lovely mom, if she wants you to, to know that she's telling you the truth, she'll get louder. Or if she doesn't think you'll understand, like if she comes to be with us, and she doesn't think that you speak English, she'll speak louder to you. So you'll understand her English even if you don't understand her English. She'll speak slowly and loudly. And I like to think Peter kind of did that. Peter was like, let me tell you. And he got louder and louder. And so how did Jesus be able to find Peter? Because Peter was being Peter loud. He had reverted back to pre-Christ Peter. And Jesus turned and he looked at him. Now that look, that look. You know, I read this week that so many men throughout the, 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 the millennial, the thousands of years that have gone through, have wondered about that look. Was it a look of disgust? Was it a look of disappointment? Did he look angry at him? Did he, was, it a, was it a I told you so moment? Aha! Or was it a look of compassion? A look of solidarity? A look of support? Don't worry, I've got you. The Bible tells us that when their eyes met, when they had that moment of electricity, so their gazes touched, Peter remembered I can just imagine that the words are in his mouth. He's, he's denying it. He's making a fool of himself. And the people are kind of moving forward. Indeed, the Gospel of John tells us that it was one of the cousins of the man whom his ear, got his ear chopped off. 
identified Jesus, identified Peter. Peter is surrounded by men who are potentially his enemy and will potentially do him harm. And he's getting loud, backing up, backing up. The eyes meet the rooster crows. Or the rooster crows, their eyes meet. Peter remembers what was said to him just a few hours earlier. And he remembers with shame his prideful boastings, his declaration of solidarity with Jesus. Everybody else, Lord, might leave you, but I'll never leave you. I am your man. This ridiculous trusting in himself that he, Peter, the big guy, Simon, Peter, the big man, nothing's ever going to get him down. Nothing's ever going to pull him back. And yet, at this moment, he sees himself for who he really is. The mask is pulled aside and he, he sees himself. I like also what it says here, the Lord, um, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. It doesn't say Jesus did. It says the Lord. That's kiros, the, the Greek word for God. Or one of the Greek words. The word of the Lord, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. The Lord turned. There's such a weightiness and power. Here we see God standing before an unjust trial. And in the midst of all of Jesus' troubles and dangers and hardship, he turns and makes sure that Peter knows that he knows. I, re- I believe that Peter didn't just remember that the Lord said that he would deny him, but also that he had prayed for him and that he would restore him. In verse 62, it says that he went outside and wept, wept bitterly. It's to sob. It may, there's a violence there. It's to be racked with. It means to, to cry with your whole being from your, your, your guts, from your stomach. To be hysterical. Peter was so overcome by shame, overcome by his guilt, overcome by his own sense of worthlessness, but also sadness for what was happening to his friend and the fact that his friend had to endure it by himself and that there was nothing that Peter could do to stop it from happening. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Beloved, there is so much that we can learn. Peter is a great lesson for you and I. It's very easy to make declarations of solidarity, of support to Jesus while we're in the safety of the meeting house. It's very easy to be bold and brash and to talk big when only surrounded by Christians. It's very easy to be enthusiastic when things are going well. It's very easy to be emboldened and impassioned when the Lord is close. But then when the time of trial comes and we must stand for the Lord in front of the world, how easy it is it to slip. See, Peter made some really fundamental mistakes. His first one was pride. Pride comes before a fall, the Bible says. God humbles the pride but gives grace to the humble. Peter was trusting far too much in his own ability. He was a big fella. He'd been able to do anything he ever wanted all his life. Nothing and no one ever stopped him. Why should it be any different now? Second, prayerlessness. He failed the test of prayer. 
Instead of seeking the Lord while he may be found, using and utilizing the time in the garden, praying to gather Christ, he allowed sorrow and tiredness. He was worn out and he didn't pray. He fell asleep. The, the reality of the test wasn't a reality to him. And therefore, when the time of testing came, he did not have the spiritual strength to be able to stand against the test. And so he faltered and he failed. Why is it important to pray? Why is it important to seek the Lord in those times of peace? Because when the time of trial comes, you may not have time for prayer. Your heart may not be in the right place. You might be exhausted. You might be full of sorrow. You might be afraid and looking, trying to be invisible or surrounded by your enemies. Prayerlessness led to the denial. Second of all, he stood too far from Christ. He followed at a distance. Beloved, you cannot follow Jesus at a distance. Often, we make the mistake in our own lives, do we not? Of being afar from Christ. Being Christian, loving Christ, but yet not with Him. Not a part of His plan. Not a part of, of the, the, the triumphant march for the kingdom. We're standing in the wrong place, falling from afar. As far from Jesus as, as we can get, but still with Jesus. Then, standing with the wrong people. Peter should have been with Jesus. Peter should have been a witness in Christ's defense. Legally so, Jesus had the right to produce defendants. People who would stand in his favor. Yet no one did. Peter had the right. No one could have spoken against him. No one had the legal right to deny him the ability to stand in the defense of his friend. And yet Peter chose not to stand with Jesus, but rather to stand in the courtyard Surrounded by the enemies of Christ. I often, beloved, when things are hard, when we fear persecution, when we fear the, the, the anger, violence, or disdain of men, do we huddle up and side with the enemies of Christ rather than to stand with Christ alone? Somehow, in some way, we kind of feel that we can placate we can calm things down. We can make them understand. If they can just understand we're just like them, they'll not hate us. If they can understand that we're not freaks and weirdos, we're not extremists or enthusiasts, enthusiasts they'll accept us. Peter was standing in the wrong place. He was standing among the Enemies of Christ, not standing as a defender of Christ. And beloved, we can do that so often. You're in work. And the people around you are telling dirty jokes. Speaking negatively about things. I think I've told you this before. I remember when I was working in Varax. Varax and uh, I was sitting at the table and all the young men were sitting around me. Because I'm an old man and young men like me. And, uh, and they were making fun of Americans, because it's a th good thing to do. And, uh, and they said, one of the young men who was beside me, who was a good friend, said, do you know that there's some, people, some Americans who believe that the flood was real? And Noah's boat was real? And that they, they actually had like dinosaurs on, that, on, that, on the ark? And I, and I looked at them and went, I, I believe that too. And he went, what? You know, like, and the whole conversation went quiet. And I stood on this 
precipice, this little edge. Do I back up my statement and kind of go, but you have your Americans, you know? I'm not like those extremists. Or do I jump in and say, not only do I believe that, but I also believe that the world was made in six days. And I was like, ah, in for a penny, in for a pound. In Ireland, there's an ex- the old expression, you better be hung for a sheep as well as for a lamb. So you're in for everything. And I said, no, no, do I believe that the world was destroyed in a flood and that God preserved humanity through Noah and his children? But I also believe that the world was created in six days and God created man and woman. And from them was born the human race. And they all looked at me as if I had three heads. They all looked at me like, Hi, Kai, you're so clever, so nice, so, so ordinary. How can you believe such crazy stuff? And I was like, because I'm a Christian and I love the Lord and it's because it's true. But we face those temptations, don't we? Do we stand with the world? Do we stand with the mockers and the scorners? Or do we stand together with Christ? Later on, that conversation led to a conversation about salvation. Why do you, Baptists, believe in adult baptism? That's such a weird thing. Well, well isn't that funny you should ask that? And that led into a three or four day long conversation about salvation at the lunch table. Do you stand with Christ or do you stand with the people of this world? Are you close to Christ or are you falling from afar? Are you together with him on your knees praying? Are you in prayer with Christ in your private life? Not just in your public life. It's easy to pray in the fellowship, in the gathering. But it's another thing to sneak off and to pray by yourself. Asking the Lord for strength. Asking the Lord to help you and to guide you. Because when the time of trial comes, it's too late. Have you proudly spoken? Have you boastfully confessed your association in our hearts? I am prepared to go to to prison and death with you, Jesus. Yes, all these people, they don't love you as much as I love you, Lord. But when the time of trial comes, we falter and we fall. All it took for Peter to begin his descent was the pointing finger of a little girl. All it took was one little scornful, and I, I, I imagine, you, you all know little girls, like my goodness. Little girls are like the worst. Where is she? Right there. I imagine she pointed and with devilish, devilishly glee, you know, everyone's talking about all these people and the ear that got stuck on, all the people who were with Jesus. And one wee girl, she wants so desperately to be part of the conversation. She wants to be the star of the conversation. She wants to have you know, everyone to know that she knows something more than they do. And as they're sitting there, she's looking and she's looking and she's looking. And then she identifies him. Yeah, that's the guy I saw earlier coming in with the other fella. And she points the finger. And it's like, I can just imagine there's a, a little pause in the conversation and her little girlish voice. He was one of them. He was with him. And then all every head turns. And every eye looks. And Peter goes, Red! And out from them pops this ridiculous, I don't know. I don't know who you're talking about. All it takes is the pointing of a finger of a little girl to topple a, a, a great man of strength. Beloved, This story is about Peter and his denial. But it is a pattern that we can all relate to. It's a pattern that is common unto all people. When we get to heaven, when we meet Peter on those roads of gold or whatever they are, we're not going to kind of look at him and say, you're the guy that denied Jesus. We're going to be able to look at him and say, I know exactly how you felt. Because I did it time and time and time again in my own life. I had, there were time after time when I was 
challenge. Do I stand together with Christ in his word or do I follow the crowd? Do I go with the masses? Do I stand with the world? And I wish to God we could all say, you know, every single time we stood together with Christ, every single time we were there in his defense, every single time without fail. But we're, we're only human, aren't we? We're just, the Bible said, made of dust, fallible, failing time and time again. When we meet Peter in those streets of gold, we're able to look at him and relate. We might be able to understand. There'll be no condemnation, no, no pointing the finger at him, no sniggering, no laughing. Just a help, heartfelt understanding. How then do we in ourselves avoid making the same problem, the mistake, difficulty, failing as Peter? And again, that's very simple. We walk humbly before our God. We don't think too highly of ourselves. Now, I'm not talking yanti lag here, people. I'm not talking socialism. I'm not talking that we're all the same. Uh, we walk humbly before our God. We understand what Christ has done for us. We understand that we are so dependent upon him that in our strength we have no ability to overcome the world, the flesh, or the devil, that we are dependent upon God and the power of the Holy Spirit through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. We walk humbly before our God, confessing our dependence upon Christ and his sacrifice. And then we pursue him in prayer. Being a prayerful people. A humble man is a prayerful man. Because a humble man knows how dependent he is upon God. He has looked upon himself and saw his lack. And understands that he will only ever receive help and strength from above. It's only by God's mercy that our lives are not shipwrecked. It's only by His grace that we are not the worst of the worst of sinners. Let us pray while we have the opportunity to pray. Let us not be among those foolish people who think, oh, when the time of trouble comes, then I'll pray. When the difficulty is upon me, in that moment, I will turn to the Lord. Those are dangerous. That's a dangerous game to play. I'm sure that the men and women of Noah's day had a little bit of a thinking like that. Prayerful. And again, let us not follow from a distance. Let's not be far away disciples, far away followers. Let's be together as a congregation. Let's not be a, among those who would rather be with the people of the world than with their own Savior. Let's not be among those who, who stand in solidarity with those who are condemning Christ. If we are to be persecuted, let it be for... The fact that we have been together with him. When the world comes and points its finger and it says, you were with them. You were with them. The first thing that pops out of our mouth is, won't, the first thing that pops out of our mouth will not be, I don't know who you're talking about. Who? Who? Who is this Jesus you speak of? I've never heard of him. They won't have to point the finger. They won't have to make the 
insinuation. Why? Because we'll be right there together with Christ. We're standing at his side. We're speaking in his defense. We are representing the kingdom. Peter had that chance. Peter had that chance. That chance slipped by him. Beloved, let's be humble. Let's be prayerful. Let's be close to your Savior. Let us not be amongst those who stand together with the people of this world. Let us not be among those who deny the, the fellowship, the people of God, who distance themselves from Christians. Isn't this just a, a wonderful illustration of a backslider? Someone who just slips further and further away from Christ. If you want to know how that happens, Peter's experience is a great example. Beloved, Peter's story doesn't end there. Christ, his story continues. And we go on, we come into the trial of Christ, we go on to the crucifixion of Christ, and then the resurrection, and put him, lo and behold, Peter's story is continued. Christ restores him. Christ draws him back. Isn't it wonderful to know that it is not you that has a hold on the Savior, but the Savior who has a hold upon you? That even in the midst of your betrayal or your denial or your letting him down, your failing and your faltering in your faith, there is a Savior who prays for you and will not let you go. That in time, after your collapse, after your terrible failures, and all of us go through them as part of the Christian life, that Jesus Christ will come and pick you up and restore you. As it happened with Peter, it happens with every believer to some extent. There's none of us who just march off in the glory. We've all stagger and fall and rise up again. It's part of the sanctific sanctification process. Peter's story is not over and our story is not over. Take heart. Please don't be among those Foolish, foolish people who think this could never happen to me. Do not challenge the Lord. Do not, uh, do not set yourself in a position where the Lord will say, I will show you the extent of your sin, of your pride, of your need for me. Beloved, walk humbly before your God. Recognize your weakness and your dependency. Recognize your helplessness. Recognize your need to be near the Savior. Pray. Oh, if the people of God would pray today, what glories, what wonders we would see. And I'm not talking about the madness of the mad prayers full of wacko things but if people really got down on their knees confessed their sins and turned to the lord cried out on behalf of their generation what what glories would we see oh that we'd see our family members our children our parents the strangers in the street a move of god as in the olden days you know i'm a great study of the olden days I want the olden days to be the now days. Humble people are prayerful people. And prayerful people are faithful people. Oh, beloved. Learn from Peter. You know, I read in one of the quotes, I love quotes. I read a quote. A wise man doesn't learn from his mistakes. A wise man learns from the mistakes of others. Be a wise man. Be a wise woman. Learn from the mistakes of Peter. Don't falter and fall and continue down that path that he did 
Recognize it. Look into your own soul. See your own weaknesses and your own needs. Walk humbly before your God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you asking for your support, asking for your help, recognizing, Lord, that we are all foolish. We are all, Lord, prideful, all too self-independent, Lord. We desperately need your help more today than ever before. Lord, we, we, we have so much and we can do so much. But Lord, all of the world, all the flesh, all the devil, Lord, separates us from you. Please, Lord, help us. Help us to walk simply before you. Help us to walk humbly before you. To be a prayerful people, Lord, oh God, that we desire to be People who are in contact with our God, not independent. Please, Lord, do not be afar from us. Please, Lord, do not allow us to be afar from you. We desire, Lord, to be those who are up close and personal with you, to be those who are brought into the inner circle, Lord, of your relationships. We desire, Father, not to follow from afar, but to be those who stand with you in the thick and in the thin, in the good and in the bad. Lord, help us. So when the trial comes, when the accusations and the finger pointing, whenever the crowds and the danger arises, Lord, we will stand. We will survive the test. We shall stand together with Christ. And not falter and fall and deny him and betray him. Oh Lord, we are grateful. We are grateful, Lord, for the knowledge that even if and when we falter and fail in those times of testing, that you are still there, that you are faithful, and that you cannot be unfaithful to yourself, that you have promised to neither leave us nor forsake us, that, Lord, we are as your children, and you will not desert us. We thank you that you are at this moment in heaven. Lord Jesus, that you are in heaven and that you intercede for the church. You're praying on our behalf that we might meet the, ta the tasks, that we might, Lord, succeed where we have perhaps failed in the past. Lord, we are grateful for we know that we will move from glory unto glory, that we are forever becoming greater and greater, that you, Lord, are perfecting your bride. Oh, Lord, we thank you that we are destined to win and not to fail. Oh, my God, we give you thanks for Peter's experience, for his denial and betrayal, but also, Lord, for his restoration. The Lord, that you caused them to repent and to turn back to you. And Lord, you were there to receive him. And Lord, that he was used of you as one of the foundation stones of the early church. We are grateful, Lord, for his witness, for his honesty, for his transparency, and for his humility and prayerful and prayerfulness. Lord, we are grateful. Oh, Father, help us to do the same in our day. Lord, we do pray this for your glory and your glory alone in Jesus' precious name. Amen.